Afternoon, everyone. So yes, my name's Aidan. Um, I'm from HomeServe. So at HomeServe, we are um, a home repair business. So if your central heating breaks down, you have a plumbing and drainage problem, we will come out and fix that for you. Now, we are essentially an insurance product, but we do also do on-demand services. What I'm going to do today is talk you through the journey for, for the last couple of years that we've been through. And I want to start with a quote. And that is, if culture comes first, performance will follow. Now, this really resonates with us, because if we jump back six or seven years, we were the complete opposite of this. And everything that we did focused on performance. So from our strategy, our KPIs, the way that our bonus structures worked, everything was based on performance. And some of you may know that led us to receive um, one of the biggest fines given out by the FCA. It ceased us from selling for a period of time. But it also gave us the opportunity to reinvent ourselves and look at what we wanted to do as a business and how we wanted to behave. Now, the what is probably the easy part. So first of all, we looked at our products. We made them better. We made them so that if a customer had a problem, we would go out and we would fix it. A bit of a different stance to a lot of insurance companies. We actually want to be called, and we want to go out and help our customers. And the reason for that is that people will see the value in the product if they use it. But like I say, that's probably the easy part. The really hard part is how you change a culture. Now, this journey started for us when we set up our customer promises. Now, our customer promises came along first. And these were set up to really say how we wanted to be as a, as, a, as a business. And we socialized this with a number of our customers. Then came our people promises, because how do we actually want to behave as individuals? And we went through a really long process of, these weren't something that the exec team came up with and said, this is what we're going to do for you. This took a year to build. Everybody got to vote on what they thought the promises should be, and the wording that went with them, and how we would bring them to life. But again, writing it is actually the easy part. It's how you then take them off the paper, off the wall where we've got them all stuck up, and bring them to life. And I'll share with you a couple of initiatives that, that we do do. The first one, we have um, a process called Customer First. We have a meeting that takes place at 8.30 every morning. It purposely takes place at 8.30 because it's before the working day really begins. And anybody from around the business can submit a question or challenge a process. We also have a hardship fund for those computer says no moments, where the guys on the front line go, we should probably do something different for this customer. And they submit it into customer first. And within there, there is a group of people. These are made up from everybody from the front line through to our senior management team that will make the decisions on what we do. Now, within this process, we've actually spent half a million pounds on our hardship fund. And that's spending money on doing jobs which the computer said no to. These were customers that had phoned up that may have been a customer for a number of years. We get a number of stories. You know, we've got an 82-year-old lady who's got a plumbing and drainage product with us, but the boiler's broken down. From a CSR perspective, those guys taking the call, that's a really difficult situation to say, sorry, we can't help. And that's why this process exists, because they're able to then take that forward and say, actually, we should do more for this customer. And where appropriate, we absolutely do that, and we pay for that to happen. But having that process in place really empowers the front line to do the right thing. And you can see that's one of our people promises. So that's just one small initiative which shows you how we bring it to life every day. From our people promises point of view, every morning at 9 o'clock within our customer service center, we have a customer huddle. And this is guys from the front line, team managers, coaches. We have a varying degree of attendance from 15 people to 70 people on a daily basis. And they'll talk about one of the promises. But then they'll also share a customer story. And they'll talk about either where they've gone above and beyond for a customer, or where they've noticed a process issue that they're going to take forward and fix. Not only that, with our people promises, and I talked earlier about KPIs driving performance, these are in everybody's objectives. These are part of our recruitment process, and our questions are aligned to our promises. So we recruit on behaviors and drive the right people into the, biz the business to behave in the right way. Now, previously, the quote was, if culture comes first, performance will follow. 
Now, with a couple of things that I've shared there, what does it do for performance? So this is what things look like today. So top left is the UK Customer Service Index. We're the red line back in 2012, 13. You can see where we were. Significant improvements in our customer service results there. We were the most improved business. And as you can see, where the trend of the, the industry came down, we continued to climb. Complaints, trading standards complaints. Now you can see, back in 2010, we were getting just under 100 in a month. Now that doesn't sound like a lot when you talk about doing over a million jobs a year, but if you think in order to make a trading standards complaint, you have to go to your local council office, sit in a darkened room somewhere and explain why you're not happy with this business. It takes a lot of effort to go and do that. And therefore, for a high volume of customers to be doing that on a monthly basis, you needed to fix what, whatever those problems were. We've done that and we see around one or two a month now. So significant improvements. Trustpilot, we are very active with driving people to our review sites and to review sites that are out there. You can see we've moved from 2.3 up to 8.4. And that 8.4 is our 17,500 reviews. So it's a really big number. And the whole point of that is it's great when you get all of those five stars and everything works. We want to know when it doesn't work so that we can make it better. Glassdoor. So we're very active on, on Glassdoor because we want to attract the right people into the business. So we're very proactive. Everybody's encouraged to go and leave a review irrelevant of positive or negative so that people know what the organization looks and feels like. Um, but also, if things are raised on there that we need to deal with, we're able to do that. And I think for me, one of the really, really impressive stats around this is if you jump back to 2011, we had a 53% engagement score. At that time, people were earning a significant more amount of money than what they do today. We've now got that to 83% because people like what they do, they enjoy what they do, and it's because of the culture that we've got. They believe they do the right thing, they're empowered to do the right thing, and we have all of those processes to support that. So it gives you a little bit of an idea about the journey that we've been on over the past few years. And part of that journey, we've been using speech analytics. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we use uh, speech. So uh, with regards to speech, we take around about 2 million calls a year with our customer service center. Um, we use speech to be a core part of our strategy. Our strategy is effortless customer service. That's what we're aiming to do, and that's what we use speech analytics for to find where high effort is going in from customers. We made a very conscious decision when we implemented speech that it was to be used for process improvement rather than a quality assurance tool, which a lot of companies use it for. But also, what's really, really important is where the speech analytics sit within the business. So they're part of the contact center, and they're in the business improvement team within the contact center because they're very close to the front line and what's happening with our people and with our customers. And we've got two full-time speech uh, analysts, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about those in a moment. Um, firstly, recruit the right people when you do this kind of thing. The one thing that our speech manager will tell you, first of all, is he's not an analyst. His background is contact centers. He was a contact center, uh, he was on the front line, team manager, a customer service manager, and then became a speech analyst. So his background is all about the service. And actually, by going down that route, he looks at things differently, and he looks at it through the customer lens. Um, he challenges everything, but he does it with fact. So a lot of people, when you're working across functions, from finance to marketing, into a contact center, will have perceptions. What he's very good at through this approach is dealing fact. This is exactly what our customers are saying. This is where we need to improve. So it's really, really important. Um, he's very patient, and we have, we have two of these. He's very patient, and he has to go through a lot of stakeholder management to get people along that journey with him and demonstrate what he's achieved. I think one of the key things about speech is have a clear direction when you use it. Understand what you want to use it for. And I, I don't think this just applies to speech. We've heard a lot about things like AI today. What happens is you'll get a shiny new toy, and you'll think, oh, it does loads of cool stuff. But actually, keep it simple. 
Why have you got that piece of kit? What do you want it to do? Make sure you've got a clear direction, and more importantly, stick to it, because there'll be other things that go on with the business that people will come along and go, oh, can I use your new shiny toy for something? And actually, if you've got a good roadmap, make sure you've got a clear direction, and you'll ensure you deliver the right results. Time. A lot of these systems, whether it's speech, AI, um, and as we've, as we've just heard from James, they're not plug and play systems. They require a lot of work to go into them to work for your business. Make sure that you build that into business plans. There's a lot of talk with this kind of investment um, about when people will see their ROI on it, and they don't factor in those lead times about getting the system to work for you within your environment. Our um, speech analyst who created the, the first lot of categories actually listened to a lot of calls to understand our customer's language. Not what he thought it would be, but actually what it was. What were the emotional words they used to describe our product, both positive and negative? And for that reason, the analysis that we get back from it is a true representation of our customer base. I think in his first year alone, he listened to 15,000 calls on his own, yes. Uh, it takes a very patient person to, to be able to do that. And I think I, I briefly touched on this, but have a plan. Make sure that you know what you're doing and make sure that you, you stick to it. This is about looking at your marketing opportunities. So what are your marketing opportunities and how are you going to align speech to them? Again, if you're going to do a campaign, you can measure what's going on pre-using speech and post-speech and then make sure you look at the results and then you move into a BAU activity. But also you can manage your, your process changes. For those who work in a regulated environment, script changes. What do they do? What's the real impact on AHT? All of that kind of stuff you can pull out from there. And I think it's really important that you have a clear methodology about using this type of um, technology. We have a business improvement team which speech sits with him. The way that we operate is we'll do some high level analysis and see whether what we thought we need to go after, we do need to. And if it comes back as yes, we should, we then go into the detail. We'll then make recommendations. And those recommendations go into our business improvement managers. And they will go out and they will implement the required changes. On the back of that, you'll then start to look at your, your cost and your benefits and the impacts to the customer and what's actually happening. But then you've got to revisit it. Everything that you've done, everything that you think you know, has that really happened when you've implemented your change? And speech can tell you that. At which point, you can then move it into a BAU process or go back to that design stage and revisit the process. Once you've done that and you move into BAU, you can then clearly state your return on investment, which is what everybody is really interested in when you have to spend a lot of money on technology. Um, and being able to do that every time is really, really powerful. So for us, what, what have we achieved through this? So one of the biggest ones is our IVR. So um, customers love IVRs. We know they all love their IVRs as they come through. Um, what we got to understand is actually why did the customer end with the person they ended with and what words did they use if they needed to be transferred out? And by doing that, we changed all of our language on our IVR and it reduced our transfers by 8%. So when you think you're taking 2 million calls in that center, to do that has a significant impact. Not only that, we have recently launched Intelligent Call Routing, and it's been heavily guided by the results of our, our speech analytics. Reducing repeat calls. One of the, the best things that we saw when we looked at reducing repeat calls was the angle that we had what we believed was OK, and then what customers thought was OK. We would tell a customer they would receive um, a refund or a document or something within 10 working days. Customer phones back in six. So whilst you're telling them it's 10, they're coming back to you in six. And we were able to identify that and actually change our processes so customers got what they needed inside three to five days to stop those calls coming back. On one process change alone, we lost 30,000 calls a year from it. So you can see that actually it breaks some of those perceptions and it deals in fact Again, it tells you how your customers are behaving. Web deflection. So a lot of people will start their journey online and then call us. 
and we're able to gather that data and look at, well, why are they doing that, and make improvements to our website, um, and make that, that customer's life a lot easier so they can complete everything online. Hold time. So we looked at the minute before people put a customer on hold, and the minute after, to see why they needed to go on hold. So did they have the right tools to hand? Do they have the right product knowledge? Do they have the right systems available to them? And by changing some of those processes, we've reduced our hold time by 20 seconds. So some really, really tangible results. But then we also have what we call our good neighbor. So we do a lot of work with vulnerable customers. And we have a project called Good Neighbor. And every week, we listen to calls where vulnerability is being identified to make sure we act appropriately as a business. And we use speech to categorize those calls and pull those calls out so we can actually see how many calls we can see vulnerability on and the actions that we've taken. Uh, emotion, both happy or unhappy. Um, you can build categories around that. You can find what words the customers are using. So some, some really powerful results. And I think as you go, you go to the bottom, so we've done over 150 speech-driven process changes in the last two years. But I think what everybody's really interested with that is we've saved a million pound in efficiencies. What's really, really important is actually we did it because it was better for the customer. And it was better for the customer, it saved us money. So the two work together. This year, we've got a target of one and a half million to get to, and we are almost there. So it's, it's going really well. So what's next for us with, with speech? We currently only use it in one of our um, four contact centers, so it's going across all of the contact centers within the next month. We'll then be able to map the full end-to-end -end journey from the moment somebody buys a product through to them making a claim and an engineer deploying. And we can pull all of that journey together to make sure it all works and get rid of any dissatisfaction or processes that, that aren't working for customers within there. But also our coaching function. This is telling us at an individual level what sort of words our people are using with our customers. So we're able to go out with targeted coaching to drive performance. So it's a really, really valuable piece of kit, and we use it in a certain way that supports our people to make them better at what they do and give a better service for our customers. So one final thought that I will, I will leave you with, whenever you look at any technology, whenever you do anything around speech or, or AI and you're going through the implementation process, whose agenda are you working to? Is it yours as a business or is it the customer's? And it's one to bear in mind whenever you go through that process. Thank you. <laughs>